Welcome to Big Papa Rob's Podcast Story Rewind, The Missing. I'm Big Papa Rob. Each of our stories are about one of the many missing people out there. We rewind the story of a missing person in hopes that someone will hear their story and can share information to help find them. There is always someone who knows something that can help find this missing person. The missing person we're going to tell you the story about is Alexandria Joy Lowitzer. She went missing after getting off the school bus on April 26, 2010 in Spring, Texas. Mandy, how was your day today? My day was pretty good. Thank you. How was your day? Not too bad. Uh, I I came across this story after I started watching her mother's TikTok about her daughter. Alexandria, who goes by Allie, has been missing 14 years now. Spring, Texas is basically a suburb of Houston, Texas in Harris County. According to NamUs, there are 28 people missing from Spring, Texas, ranging back to 1986. Of those 28 people, eight are female, and they range in the age between 15 and 17 years old at the time of their disappearance. Let's rewind Allie Lewitzer's story. Allie was born February 3, 1994, to Joanne and John Lowitzer in Pasadena, Texas. Allie had an older brother, Mason, that was three years older than her. According to Allie's mother, Mason loved his little sister and was very protective of her. Joanne sent us several pictures of them when they were little. I'll post one on my social media page. In 2000, the family moved to Spring, Texas. In 2008, Allie's parents sadly separated, and Allie and her brother Mason, they continued to live with their mother in the Spring, Texas home. In Christmas of 2009, Allie received her very first cell phone. Now, you know how teenagers are with their cell phones, but especially a teenage girl. As with most teenagers, she took to her cell phone texting regularly, and she averaged 3,000 to 4,000 texts a month. One thing she didn't have, unlike teenagers today typically have, was internet on her phone. Data plans were still expensive back then and not unlimited like it is today. Allie was very busy with school. She played softball, she was in the Girl Scouts, and she sang in the choir. In fact, there's a video of her singing the national anthem on YouTube. Rob is going to link that in the show notes when we're done with our story. Allie is also very, she's a very good artist and was in advanced art classes in school. In fact, we read somewhere that she did a mural on a wall at her grandmother's house. I would love to see that picture. That would be just awesome, wouldn't it, Rob? I think so, too. As with most teenage girls, she's very sociable, but she also liked just sitting in her room, listening to music and writing in her journal or working on an art project. One thing that jumped out at us when looking at Pictures Valley was the dark eye makeup phase she was in just before going missing. Rob said it reminded him of his oldest granddaughter at that age and how their makeup style was so much alike. He said he always described it as a goth phase. I don't know 
if Allie was into goth, but that's the best way to describe it, I guess. Allie got her first job at a place called Burger Barn, which is about a quarter mile from her house. On Monday, April 26, 2010, it started as any other day in the Lowitzer house. The kids were getting ready for school and Joanne getting ready for work. As with most days, Allie left the house before Joanne to go to school. Throughout the school day, Allie and Joanne communicated via calls and text messages. At first, she told her mom she was staying after school to work on a project and one of her friends were going to give her a ride home when they were done. Later, Allie had communicated with her mother that it wasn't going to work out and that she was going to ride the bus home. We don't know why, you know, she didn't stay and work on the project, just that something had changed. Did you ever read anything, Rob, about that it was that the kids couldn't stay or they just... No, I I just chucked it it up as uh, typical kids. Uh, She wanted to stay with her friend and then realized things just wasn't going to work out and changed changed the plan. Oh, okay. So just before Allie got on the bus, she called her mother to ask if she could walk to the burger barn to get her paycheck And she also wanted to see if she could work a few hours that day. Joanne was not thrilled about this, and she was hesitant to let Allie do it. As with most teenagers at this age, she pleaded with her mother, wearing her down, and finally Joanne gave in and allowed Allie to walk to the burger barn. You know, I could just see that conversation because of my step-teenage daughters when they were growing up doing the please mom exactly I, i'm big enough you know i'm big enough to do this exactly so exactly. i could see how that whole conversation went exactly mm-hmm. Allie was captured on the spring high school surveillance camera at 2 25 p.m leaving the school school bus footage shows Allie on the bus and when she exited the school bus with two other boys that live in the neighborhood The boys recounted that she was lagging behind and texting on her phone at the corner of the street where they got off the bus. This was only two houses away from Allie's home. The last eyewitness account of Allie stated she was walking away from her home, exiting the neighborhood. The last communication recorded was a text message sent to a friend at 2.57 p.m. According to Google Maps, it would have taken 12 minutes to walk the 0.6 miles to the burger barn. We don't know what the area looked like back in 2010, but Rob used Google Earth to retrace the steps from the corner um, she got off the bus at to where the burger barn used to be on Cypress Wood Drive. The short walk out of the neighborhood she lived in, she could have walked on the sidewalk till she got to the main road and I hope I don't butcher this word up, Trishwig Road. She would would have walked along the grass shoulder on the two-lane road. Joanne, remember that's Allie's mother, returned home from work around 5.30 p.m., and Allie wasn't home yet. But she wasn't too worried at this time because Allie did say she was going to see if she could work a couple hours at the burger barn. So then... she figured Allie would call or message her when she got on her break or something. Um, and it says Joanne did send Allie a text around 7 PM, but didn't get a response. Then she started to get a little concerned by 8 PM. Joanne, she still hadn't heard from Allie. So Joanne knew that the burger barn closes at nine. So she left just before nine to go pick Allie up at the burger barn. But when she got there to her surprise, when she arrived at the burger barn, she was all, it was already closed. The lights were off, chairs were placed on the table, everything. You could, it was clear that they had been closed for a while. And this is when Joanne became very concerned of the whereabouts of her daughter. Joanne called her husband, John, and other family members to see if they had heard from Allie, and they had not. Then they started calling Allie's friends and driving to the houses of her friends to see if Allie was with them. Allie taking off or changing plans without telling her mother was just something Allie would not do. 
Her family and friends spent hours frantically looking, calling, and texting Allie with no results whatsoever. Allie's parents called the police, and the Harris County Sheriff's Office sent an officer out that took a brief look in Allie's room and told the worried parents to call them tomorrow when she comes home. Wait a minute, Rob. So the officers didn't say, um, we're going to take a report. We're going to, they're going to do something. They just said, call us tomorrow when she comes home. They're just assuming that she's coming home. They didn't take this as a, a, a kidnapping or a disappearance or anything at that time. Nope. They just thought chucked it up as a runaway. Uh, they assume because, well, this is my mm. opinion and I've heard this in other people, uh, that the goth style makeup mm-hmm. and things that she was a bad child, but in reality, wow. she was a great child yeah. with everything yeah. that I've seen about her. Yeah. Joanne asked the officer, what do we do if she doesn't come home? And the officer says, call us. No report was taken and no other advice was given. One thing to note about Allie's room, her phone charger was still laying next to her bed. Her purse with $40 was still in it in her bedroom, along with all of her personal effects like makeup. And as you know, with, with girls, they don't go anywhere for a long period of time without their makeup. These are not the things that someone running away would just leave behind. The next morning, there was still no sign of Allie. After spending the day trying to find Allie, Joanne took the advice of a friend at Girl Scouts Council and called Laura's Recovery Center. Uh, Rob, I have a question. What is the Laura Recovery Center? I had to look that up myself. The Laura Recovery Center is a nonprofit organization that works to prevent kidnappings and abductions and recover victims such and such events. The center is in Friendswood, Texas, and is named for Laura Kate Smitter, Smither, a 12-year-old girl that was abducted near her friend's home and murdered. The next day, members of the Laura Recovery Center helped organize the group of friends and family and encouraged law enforcement active participation. When law enforcement finally got involved, they interviewed the boys that got off the bus with Allie. The employees at the burger barn said they didn't see her that day, and the manager said she never came to pick up her paycheck. Law enforcement concluded that there was no evidence of a crime that took place and classified her as a runaway. It sounds like they classified her as a runaway the first night that they showed up at the house. Yeah, it does. As you can imagine, the family was devastated by this. They knew in their hearts of heart that Allie did not just run away. Since Allie's phone was on her mother's phone plan, um, her mom, Joanne, had access to find out more about the activities on Allie's phone. Allie's phone stopped pinging cell towers at about 3 p.m. If you recall from earlier, her last recorded text was at 2.57 p.m. Her phone has never been active since that time. They did have one number in her phone call list from Las Vegas, Nevada, but this appeared to be a friend that had used her mom's phone to call Allie. There was another Las Vegas number that they could not track, and when calling it, no one answered. A private investigator was able to gain access to Allie's email, and he found that the last login to her email was from a Las Vegas IP address. Her savings account has never been accessed since she went missing. John... Allie's father, um, he has discovered that the Shell Station at the intersection of Treshrig Road and Cypresswood Drive has security cameras that face the corner where Allie would have passed by. And the the Shell Station made a copy of the camera footage and gave it to John. He then turned it over to the police, and the police lost it, the only copy of the footage. Um, Now, Rob... Where did you, where did you get this information from about the police lost that one copy of that footage? That's just 
I got it's that wild. actually from Allie's mother when she yeah. was uh, doing an interview uh, with a news uh, source, and that she she's the one that said this, and I just can't believe how how this happened. I mean, wow, they had reviewed the footage themselves mm-hmm. and didn't see her, but they were hoping the police could enhance the footage and see if they could see inside the vehicles that may be driving by that area. Oh, okay. And then they, did they, it was it ever, did it ever come out for, did you find out from Joanne how they said they lost it? I don't think that they ever told Joanne and them how they lost it. Oh, wow. Other than the camera footage at the school, this was the only security camera along the path that Allie would have taken. In 2010, we didn't have the ring doorbells like we have today. It took until 2012, Allie's 18th birthday, before the police would remove the classification runaway. Then the case moved over to the homicide division, which really probably was a big mistake because when you move, when the homicide division is taking care of this, you got to consider how many homicides that are going on in that area which means this case just ended up sitting on a shelf yeah, for the most possibly. part and probably still is just sitting on a shelf yeah. because there's more pressing cases for them mm-hmm. than a runaway, even though they changed the classification. Yeah. But it's, and still, I mean, it, it's been 14 years. So like you said, it's probably on a shelf somewhere, all the information. The family had several private investigators over the years since Allie's disappearance. Unfortunately, at least one of them dropped the ball and didn't follow up on tips correctly and misinformed the family on information. They had one lead that took family to Columbus, Ohio, with a possible sighting at a prostitution house. The police raided this place, but Allie wasn't there. There was a young lady that looked similar to Allie that had been there at one point, and it was confirmed that this young lady was not Allie. At this point, it's been 14 years since Allie disappeared, and we're no closer to knowing where she is today than we did 14 years ago. Did someone she know pick her up with ill intent? Or was someone able to just pull her into a vehicle along her path? Was this related to being kidnapped for sex trafficking? Were the Las Vegas phone numbers and access to Allie's email related to her disappearance? If the police had taken this case seriously in the beginning, would we be still searching for answers to this disappearance? Let's talk about Alexandria Joy Lewitzer. She was last seen April 26 of 2010 around 3 p.m. in Spring, Texas. She was 16 years old at the time she went missing and is 30 years old today. She was last seen wearing a white t-shirt, dark hoodie, black and white checkered skinny jeans, and black tennis shoes. She was carrying a blue LG GR500 slide cell phone and a checkered multicolored backpack. Allie is 5 feet 2 inches tall with natural brown hair that was dyed in a dark auburn red. She weighed 145 pounds. She has blue eyes. She also wears braces, and her ears and nose are pierced. She also has a small scar from chicken pox between her eyes. If you have any information, please call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST. Or you can call the Harris County Sheriff's Office at 713-221-6000, case number HC1000-5735. There is a reward in this case. I want to talk about Joanne Lowitzer for a couple of minutes, Allie's mother. Joanne, along with help from the Texas Center for the Missing, started Houston Missing Persons Day. This day is observed on February 3rd, which is Allie's birthday. Joanne also created a private group on Facebook called Moms of the Missing as a safe place 
that for mothers of missing children, they can connect there. She also uses her Facebook page called Hope for Allie to not only share information about her daughter, but also share information on other missing persons. I also encourage you to check out alexandrialewitzer.com for more information about Allie and other resources for missing persons. The stories I tell about the missing, I hope arms you with new information about this missing person that might lead to finding them. Additionally, I hope that you will share information about this person in hopes that by sharing, it may lead to locating this person. As with almost all missing person cases, there is someone out there that knows something please come forward and contact the authorities. Once again, I'm Big Papa Rob, and this was an independent podcast called Big Papa Rob's Podcast Story Rewind. It is written and produced by Big Papa Rob. Story editing is done by Mandy. I couldn't have done this without the support of my wonderful wife, Mandy, a.k.a. Big Mama. If you've enjoyed my podcast, please leave a five-star rating and tell others about my podcast. Finally, if you have a story idea, please contact me through social media or email. A link to my social media accounts is listed in the show notes. I would love to hear from you. Today's music was The Shield by Hot Dope from Pixabay. This was a Big Papa Rob podcast 2024. See the show notes for links to the reference material used in this podcast.